everyone. Uh, my name is Sam Samantha Harlow, and I'm the online learning librarian as well as the kinesiology and public health education librarian for UNCG Libraries. UNCG Libraries created a series of webinars for the UNCG community on online learning innovation, and welcome. In this series, different UNCG instructional technology consultants, ICS staff, and faculty will cover topics on online learning pedagogies, UNCG instructional technology tools, such as Canvas, Googlebox, et cetera, and more. These are 30-minute webinars that are recorded in WebEx meetings, which we are in now, and placed on the library um, webpage that I am going to throw into the chat. These are under the online learning tab. Uh, but there's also one on research and application. So um, we also give the recording files to the ITC, ITS staff member or faculty member presenting the materials, and they can do whatever they want with the recording as well. These recordings are put on YouTube and closed captions as soon as we are able. So I'm going to cover some logistical things about how this webinar is going to run. Please mute your audio during the presentation by clicking the audio X icon next to your name to turn it red. But feel free to turn your audio back on by clicking the audio icon again at the end of the webinar to participate in the conversation with the presenters. Um, if you don't have a microphone, if you're having trouble unmuting yourself, just use the chat on the um, bottom of your screen. There's a little icon, um, and I can unmute you and help you with anything. And as well as that, if there are any technical issues during the webinar, you can put them in the chat if you can find it, or you can email me. Um, I'm throwing that in the chat, as well as call me. I'll be muted so it won't interrupt Rob's flow. So um, are there any questions before I introduce our presenter? Okay. So this session is hosted by Rob Owens, an instructional technology consultant for the Bryan School. And it is on universal design for learning, the basics, or a primer. And um, Rob, you can begin. Hello, can everyone hear me? Yes, Sam? we can hear you. Okay, great. Well, actually, I think I'm going to turn, since I'm wearing a headset, I'm going to turn off the video, my video, so we'll just do audio for this particular session. Thanks, Sam. Again, my name is Rob Owens, and I am an instructional technology consultant for the Bryan School of Business, and we're going to be talking about universal design. Some of you may have already heard of this concept, and so it might be a review for some of you. So I'm an instructional designer with the Bryan School of Business. I've been uh, here at the university since 1998, except for three years when I actually went to Winston-Salem State University to work in their uh, Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning as a faculty development specialist. And then I taught full time as a visiting assistant professor at Campbell. Other than that, I've spent most of my time here at UNC Greensboro, either in the Bryan School or in the University Teaching and Learning Center. I also teach part-time um, in the Sport and Performance Psychology program at the University of Western States, which is located in Portland, Oregon. So this presentation is going to come from two different foci. One, I'm going to talk about my experience using universal design as an, as an instructional designer, as well as a um, faculty member at Western States. So the learning objectives, we're going to talk about what universal design is, why we should use universal design, particularly when we're working with students in online, uh, in online learning. I'm going to talk about two, two different approaches of universal design that have been used in higher education, and then I'm going to do a brief demo in Canvas. Uh, suggest some resources for faculty who might be new to universal design, and of course, um, I'll ask, answer any questions that you might have. So in terms of universal design, universal design is actually based on the design of physical spaces, and it was developed by Ron Mace and colleagues back in the 1990s. So basically, when we're talking about universal design, we're talking about how can we design physical spaces to accommodate people of various sensory, mental health, intellectual health, um, abilities, or disabilities. And originally, um, there were seven principles of universal design. I'm not going to 
go over all of these right now because I'm going to come back to it when I talk about universal design for instruction. But just to let you know that when universal design was first created, it had seven different principles to help uh, architects design physical spaces in order to accommodate the needs of people with various abilities. Okay, so getting into the instructional aspect of universal design, um, it was developed by Scott, Universal Design for Instruction, so let me clarify that, because I'm going to talk about Universal Design for Learning here in a little bit. But Universal Design for Instruction was developed by Scott and colleagues back in 2001, drawing on principles from North Carolina State's University Center for Universal Design. And basically, when we're talking about Universal Design for Instruction, we're talking about how can we maximize student learning by applying universal design principles to all aspects of instruction. And that will become clearer when we get to the actual principles of universal design here in a second. The other thing I want to briefly mention, because many of you have probably heard about Chickering and Gamson's seven principles for good practice in undergraduate education. When Scott and colleagues were developing universal design for instruction, they also want to incorporate these seven principles, which includes encouraging contact between students and faculty. So when I talk about universal design, we're going to talk a lot about interaction between students and faculty and students and students. Uh, develop reciprocity and co cooperation among students, encourage active learning, giving prompt feedback, emphasizing time on task, communicating high expectations of our students, and respecting diverse talents and ways of learning. So when we're talking about universal design for instruction, we're not only talking about universal design principles, but we're also talking about the seven principles for good practice in undergraduate education. Okay, so getting back to the principles. As I mentioned previously, originally there were seven principles for universal design, but that was, again, universal design was intended for physical spaces until, um, you know, Scott and colleagues and the people at uh, CAST, and I'll talk about CAST here in a little bit, decided to take those original seven principles and then add two principles to create what's known as universal design for instruction. So the first principle of universal design for instruction is equitable use. So we're trying to, from a physical standpoint, it's designing a physical spaces to help people with diverse abilities. As instructors, our objective is to provide different ways for students to demonstrate their knowledge. So what universal design is basically telling us as instructors is that we should prov provide a variety of assessments to our students. They shouldn't just all be qualitative, like written assessments or quantitative assessments like uh, multiple choice, true, false exams. So in order to meet the needs of diverse learners, we should provide um, a variety of assessments in our online courses. The second principle is flexibility and use. So flexibility and use says that as instructors, we should use a variety of instructional methods. So that means when we're communicating our content, we should communicate it in multimodal ways. And what I mean by that is that we should communicate it using text, we should communicate it using audio, we should communicate it using video. So some instructors like to create narrated PowerPoint lectures to kind of add audio with audio, audio with graphics. Um, you can design group activities or you can have discussion-based assignments. Another thing about flexibility in use, which I did not um, include here, but it's very important for universal design, is that we provide students with choice. So if the students are learning a particular topic, you might provide them, instead of providing them with one or two articles to read on that topic, you might provide them with six different articles and let them choose which articles to read that will help them learn the content. So that's also what one universal design for instruction means by flexibility in use. The third uh, principle is simple and intuitive use. So that means our design should be straightforward um, so students can understand it. That might include using Canvas, using modules in Canvas. For those of you who use Canvas, I'm sure most of you do, um, designing your online course in an easy way so students can find what they need. It also means using things like rubrics so students can understand how they will be graded. So a lot of these principles in universal design, I'm sure that most of you are using already, but you may not have put it within the context of universal design. The next principle is called perceptible information. 
And this really attends to students who might have some sort of sensory uh, disability. So they might have some sort of hearing impairment or they might uh, be blind. For example, um, in O'Brien School, we have a student who's uh, blind who is um, in one of our online programs. And so when designing for him, we have to take into a number of, of, uh, of things because he cannot see. So when it comes to perceptible information, you may want to include like textbooks that can be digitized, put in a digital format. So for example, Pablo, our student in the business school, he cannot read a hard copy textbook. We had to put his textbooks in a digital format um, by going through the um, Office of Accessibility Resources and Services. And not only does his textbook need to be put in a um, digital format and a PDF, but it also needs to be in a format where screen readers can read it because not all screen readers can read all PDFs. And that's a common misconception among faculty. They think like, okay, if I go take, I can go scan this book chapter and then screen readers would be able to read it. Um, in most cases, when you're scanning textual information, you're scanning it actually as a graphic. So each of the pages are being read, being seen by screen readers as graphic and not as text. So there's a particular way of scanning um, textual information to make sure it's, uh, it's readable by a screen reader. The other thing when we're talking about perceptual inform, uh, information, we need to provide transcripts for any videos. For example, with Pablo, because he cannot see, he can hear, but he can't see exactly what might be going on, on the screen in the video. So we need to create a transcript that actually describes not only um, what's being said, but what's actually happening in the video. Okay, the next principle of UDI is tolerance for error. And this can and this can be a little confusing at first because when it was first developed for as a universal design principle for physical spaces, it really meant we need to design physical spaces in ways that um, prevent accidents or try to minimize accidents. When it comes to instruction, tolerance for error means that we want to design our instruction in ways to accommodate individual learning pace, so students that might have some type of learning deficit or students that may not have the prerequisite knowledge for the course. It also means that in order to do that, um, some of the strategies that we can use as instructors are giving students practice. So instead of just having um, a midterm exam and a final exam, you have quizzes in there that are low stakes that prepare students for the midterm exam or the final exam when you're teaching online. It also means if you're having any sort of assignment that requires writing, that you allow students to submit rough drafts. Because we can't automatically assume that all of our students, depending on, on the programs that you're teaching in, it may have been 10 years since they've written a 20-page paper. Uh, the next principle of, you know, of UDI is low physical effort. And that means design can be used efficiently and comfortably with a minimum of fatigue. And this uh, principle really refers to, again, people that have um, physical disabilities. So for example, with uh, our blind student, um, Pablo, he, since he cannot see uh, web pages, so he can't see what's going on in Canvas, he, the screen reader has to be able to um, show his video controls, and he has to be able to navigate that using a keyboard because not all students can use, um, use a mouse to navigate. So it's important that we design our courses in ways to minimize physical effort for our students, unless the course is like an exercise course or something where there is supposed to be physical effort. Um, but we need to design our courses in ways that students can use a keyboard to navigate through the course. And that's why we have instructional technology consultants on campus in the Bryan School. Um, I'm here in the Bryan School. We have a second person in the Bryan School. Each unit, academic unit, has at least one instructional technology consultant that is familiar with these principles and can assist instructors with incorporating them in their online courses. The last main principle of universal design is size and space for approach and use. And I'm not going to really spend too much time on this because basically it's meant for physical spaces. We want to design our classrooms in ways to accommodate diverse learners. So if you're teaching in a face-to-face -face class, you may want to arrange seats 
uh, seats in the ways where students can actually see your mouth because students who might be hard of hearing or might who have or might have like attention deficit disorder they need to actually see your face in order to to focus and try to understand what you're talking about when you're communicating your content. The two additional principles that were added to UDI that were not part of the original uh, universal design are community of learners and instructional climate. So. UDI, when it talks about community of learners, is really referring to designing instruction to promote learner-to-learner -learner and learner-to-instructor interaction. And it's important for us to consider those things. For example, I mentioned that I teach part-time for the University of Western States um, and I perform in psychology classes, so one of the classes that I teach is in organizational and group dynamics. And so one of the assignments that students have to do, they have to complete a weekly discussion form. So that, I designed that in ways for students could, to kind of learn from each other. So they have to read a chapter, they have to peruse different articles, and then they have a discussion prompt, and they talk about the topic um, within themselves as a group. Now, some instructors see discussion forums as a means of having students communicate, but also as a means for the, the instructor to also communicate with students. I don't approach it from that perspective. I see my discussion forums as learner-to-learner -learner interaction, where I will only intervene in the case where I feel like the discussion is really going off topic, or if um, students are not getting a particular concept, I might intervene then. Um, but oftentimes what I do is I wait until after discussion, the discussion period is over, and then I summarize what was in the discussion, and then I add additional detail if I, feel, if I feel that students have missed something during that particular discussion period. So the second way, the second thing you want to do, and we already all do this, is that we want to have learner to instructor interaction. So in general, we're going to provide feedback on assignments to our students. And this really falls in line with the uh, community of inquiry uh, framework. If you have heard, uh, heard of this framework before, is one of the main frameworks used in online learning because it argues that instructors should use cognitive presence, social presence, and teaching presence when teaching online. So if you're not familiar with that framework, I suggest that you uh, uh, look it up and do some reading on it if you are teaching in an online environment. The last of our nine principles is instructional climate. So we want our courses to be welcoming and inclusive to students of all different abilities, and we want to set high expectations. So it's important for, for us in the Bryan School to make sure that even though Pablo is blind, that we still set high expectations for him and not assume that, okay, well, you can't perform as well as the sighted students in the online program. Okay, now turning our attention away from UDI for a second and talking about, we're going to talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about a universal design for learning. UDI came first, so I wanted to give everyone kind of like a broad overview of what UDI is. But now I want to talk a little bit about universal design for learning because it's probably the more, it's, it's, it's a more common approach um, that people may have been, that may, people may have heard of. So universal design for learning is a framework to improve and optimize teaching and learning for all people based on scientific insights into how humans learn. So it's based on cognitive neuroscience. And it basically argues that learners learn through three different networks, through effective networks, recognition networks, and strategic networks. So effective networks are, are the why of learning. As instructors, we want to stimulate student interest and motivation of learning. And so we know that you know, when it comes to cognitive neuroscience, you know, the limbic system and the amygdala, they're all about um, stimulating interest and engagement. Uh, recognition networks, the what of learning. As instructors, we want to present information in different ways to accommodate the needs of diverse learners. And then with strategic networks, the how of learning. As instructors, we want to differentiate the ways that students can express what they know. So we want to stimulate interest and motivation for learning. We want to present information and content in different ways. And we want to differentiate the ways that students can express what they know. So basically what UDL says is that we need to give students choices, 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 choices. You'll see that um, if you read any of uh, the scholarly articles about UDL, you can't, you can't read an article without the word choice being in that 
article because it's all about giving our learners choices when we're talking about universal design. And we give our students choices through three different ways, multiple means of representation, multiple means of expression, and multiple means of engagement. So the first principle of UDL, uh, provide multiple means of representation. We want to present our content in multiple ways. So instead of just having all videos out there, if you're doing lectures, you want to provide transcripts of the videos, you want to have captions for students that might be hearing impaired. Uh, other things that you can do, you can uh, create an outline ahead of time for each module. So if you have like you know, your first week's module might be introducing students to a particular concept, you can actually provide an outline saying this is where we're going. This is where we are. These are the concepts you're going to learn and this is what you should know by the end of this module. So you don't want your students to just be looking at a video not knowing exactly where they're going in terms of their learning. You want to give them those prompts ahead of time. In terms of principle two, provide multiple means of action and expression. This again goes back to our learners and giving them ways to express what they know. Um, so in terms of, for example, students that don't like to write a lot, if you do have an assignment, you can give them the option of either do a 10, 15 page paper or do a PowerPoint, or narrate a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, or let them create a video or uh, give them a way to like express themselves creatively in order to demonstrate what they know. Because what we're trying to do really is encourage executive functioning within our students. Um, so we want to guide our students and um, guide our students in the learning process. So for example, in one of the courses I'm teaching now, the students, their final project is what's called an organizational assessment plan. And working in groups, what they do is that they take an organization and they go into that organization and look at a particular issue or performance problem that the organization might be experiencing at the time, and then they design an intervention to, um, to minimize that problem or to, to alleviate the problem that the organization has. So it might be a problem. They go in and do an assessment of the organization. They find that there's a problem with um, employee um, wellness. So they might design a wellness program for the organization. Or one of the projects that my, one of the teams that is working on right now is resilience. So oftentimes my students are working with people who are working with organizations where the workers are in high stress, high performance environments. So it usually includes professional sports teams, it includes the military, it includes tactical populations like the police or fire rescue. And so um, they're in very high stressed type of environments anyway. And so one of um, my groups is working on a resilience intervention and how to make employees more resilient in a particular organization. And so one of the things that I do, uh, that I've done for them is I like modeled this, uh, I model like how, what I would do if I was consulting with that particular organization. So for example, I would say that you, know, you need to allow that organization to define resilience, because even though resilience comes from positive psychology, the organization may have a different definition of resilience than the definition that's within um, the scholarly literature. Because if you want them to um, adopt the intervention that you're designing, it, they, need to, they need to have that buy-in. So that's one way to that I use. That one way I help my students um, in modeling decision making when it comes to their projects. So the third principle is provide multiple means of engagement. So there's a couple ways we can do that as instructors. We can design our learning. Um, we can design our assignments to have some sort of experiential learning opportunity or service learning opportunity. The example I just described um, previously with my students with the organizational assessment plan, that's more of something where it's like an experiential learning op opportunity where they can go into an organization and they can work with that organization to design an organizational performance intervention. You can use things like case studies to get the students to think through problems. Um, you can also, um, if you have a culminating assignment, you can break that assignment up into smaller projects or what I call milestones. The organizational assessment plan that I use in my organizational dynamics class is broken up into milestones. 
Um, you can provide students with examples of excellent work. So you can, if you de-identify, if you ask permission and de-identify past projects from students, you can incorporate them into your future courses. Uh, you also want to help students with self-regulation. Now, with where I teach, it's like this, the course I'm teaching now is all doctoral students, and most of them are pretty well self-regulated. Most of them are holding down full-time jobs as well as studying, um, uh, studying for their doctorate. But in cases where you might be teaching at the undergraduate level, you may want to model that self-regulation through your own communication. So one of the things that I do with my students, I tell them if they email me, I'll tell them, well, I'll get back to you the next day. So it's like I might say, I'm in the middle of something now, I'll get back to you the next day. Or I might tell them, I might send an email saying, okay, well, I'm doing this this weekend. I'll have your projects graded by Sunday at this time to show them that I, that I myself am very self-regulated, that I plan things out. So modeling self-regulation for your students through communication is one thing. You can also have them journal do self-reflective activities in order to um, promote self-regulation. And another thing, is, and this is particularly um, um, something I do often with my students because they're in a program where a lot of them are positive anyway. Sometimes they're so positive that it's like, oh, you know, it's too much positivity coming at me. But you want them to help, you want them to achieve a growth mindset instead of a fixed mindset, especially when they encounter uh, difficult course materials. And if you haven't read the work by, by Carol Dweck, you certainly should so, you should certainly do so. So those are basically the three principles. And what I want to do now, if there are no questions, I want to go into Canvas and give you a demo of how I actually use some of these principles in my own teaching. So this is uh, a course in Canvas. I've taught this course in Canvas and in Blackboard. It's basically a multicultural counseling course because the program that I'm in uh, that I teach in sport and performance psychology, but when students graduate, they uh, have the opportunity to become licensed professional counselors. So it's basically kind of a glorified counseling program for, uh, for specialized populations. So in Canvas, what I do, I always organize my materials for my online courses by modules. So I have a Begin Here module that includes the syllabus, it includes the assignment descriptions, and it includes all the rubrics for all of the assignments so students know exactly how they're going to be graded. And then I take each module is a particular topic, like the first week we talk about what is multicultural psychology, and the second week we talk about worldviews and cultural competence. So you can see here that each week I have a particular topic, and each um, week's topic has a lesson, and I'll show you a lesson here in a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a second. And then there's also links to resources, to articles, scholarly articles that students can read in order to get a better grasp of the concept that we're talking about for the week. Now, since I'm actually doing this course right now, I'm going to go ahead in the future because I don't want you to see what my students have been writing. Okay, so module eight. So this week, um, we're talking about multicultural issues and research testing and assessment. And th this can be a difficult concept for students to get because we're taught and taught in our research that, okay, well, you know, research is um, objective if we're talking about, um, if we're talking about mostly quantitative research, we're taught that, you know, that type of research is objective. And so students have to learn how to wrap, um, have to learn how to, like, look at research from, a, 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 they have to learn how to look at research from a practitioner perspective. How can I use my uh, multicultural research when working with, with, with different sorts, different types of clients? So here we have our lesson. There's an overview of what the students are going to learn. They have to read a chapter and a textbook. And then there's four different articles. They don't have to read all of these four articles. So it goes back to that universal design um, concept of giving them more information that they need to know and allowing them the choice of picking what they want to read in order to learn the, the concepts. The other thing that I do, I do include a video. So there's a video for students. And then the video includes captions. 
the captions aren't turned on, you have to turn them on. So that's one thing to think about when, you, when you're um, working with your students in Canvas. I also give students the opportunity to, des to download the lecture slides. So if they looked at the video and they got the concepts for, for the most part, but then if they want to go back and review, instead of rewatching the video, they can actually just download the lecture slides, or they can download a transcript of the lecture. So I give them a couple different opportunities on how to access the content. Then they have their particular. Then they have their assessment activities. They have to answer a question. So I use discussion forms for that. So this is the question that they have to answer this week regarding um, multicultural practice and sport and sports psychology. And then they have an assessment, which is basically a low stakes assessment. It's just a quiz, but that quiz helps to prepare them for the high stakes assessment um, at the end of the course, which is a, a final exam. And a final exam actually prepares them for a certification, which, which is called the Certified Mental Performance Consultant Credential. So it's important for me um, when I'm teaching um, this course and other courses that I actually uh, give the students enough knowledge where they're able to pass the Certified Mental Performance consultant exam because we want them to be able to get that credential. Um, talking about different types of assignments in the course, I do have quantitative assignments like I mentioned the final exam. I have quizzes that help students prepare for the final exam. I also have qualitative assignments so the students have to complete what's called a cultural plunge activity and this is an experiential activity where they have to go into a setting um, where they're unfamiliar with a particular group of people. So. Um, students might go to some sort of fair, or they might go to a homeless shelter. So they were, the whole purpose is to help them learn about a group of people that are different than from them. So they go into the, that particular setting, they take field notes, and then they report, they self-reflect on their experience being the minority in that particular uh, setting. They also have to write a personal identity development paper where they're, again, are uh, self-reflecting about themselves working with different populations that might be different than them and taking into account their own growth and development and their own like social and personal identities. So again, this is one way on how you might structure your, your course. So it's kind of goes to the tenets of universal design for instruction and a uni, uh, universal design for learning. It's providing choice to our students and um, giving them the opportunity to uh, do projects using uh, multiple, giving them opportunity to, to access content in multiple ways. Oh, yes, sorry about that. I, if anyone has any questions, going, please. I just was like giving um, people a chance. Okay. You can put questions in the chat as Rob is um, wrapping up. Yeah, and so basically, you know, universal design for learning in particular is, is pretty straightforward. We want to give our students, um, we want to express our content in different ways so our students have choices in how they're learning the, or learning and interacting with the content. We want to give students the ability to show what they learned in different ways by either through writing or using presentations or other forms of, of, of creativity in our assignments. And we just want to um, engage them. So thinking through those three different principles, providing multiple means of representation, um, providing multiple means of action and expression for our students, and providing multiple means of engagement is really what universal design for learning is all about. And some of the more high-level technical things, again, uh, if you're unaware of how to make PDFs accessible, for example, you can talk to your instructional technology consultant uh, about that. But that's basically all I have. I do recommend, I do have a few resources for those of you who might be new to Universal Design for Learning. First resource is called Teaching Every Student in a Digital Age, Universal Design for Learning. And the other is Universal Design for Learning Theory and Practice. And you can get both of these books from Jackson Library. Does anyone have any questions or comments uh, for Rob? 
um, feel free to put them in the chat or you can unmute yourself if you're having trouble unmuting your, muting yourself I am happy to do it uh, you can just let me know through chat or by raising your hand in your video and as you guys are thinking of your questions uh, I do want to note that there um, the next uh, one in this series, Online Learning and Innovation, that is coming up is in April, Thursday, April 4th at 11 a.m. And it's on library online tutorials and research for students and instructors. Mm -hmm. um, and it's to talk about various online tutorials that we do at UNCG Libraries. Um, I very much enjoyed the session. I love UDL. Um, and yeah. I use right. it when I make my tutorials. Yeah, there you so go. Shelly asks, are your modules about a week long? Yes, so basically my modules start Monday morning and run through Sunday evening. So students are given a discussion prompt on Monday morning. They have until Thursday evening to craft their initial post, and then they have to reply to at least two different students by Sunday evening. If there's a, um, a project that's due, as it's always due on, on Sunday evenings, except for at the very end of the semester where it's due during the middle of the week. So one of the things I think that helps students to self-regulate so they know every Thursday night I have to do my initial post and I need to complete the follow-up post by Sunday um, evening or I need to um, submit a, a, a project or submit a major assignment by Sunday evening. So that helps with self-regulation. Are there any other questions? Well, that's great. Again, it's pretty straightforward. Um, I encourage you to also, and, and you'll see this in the uh, in the video, but I will also send Sam my slides. So here are the references. I encourage you to take a look at um, the online community of inquiry review that's talking about um, social pregnancy, cognitive presence, and teaching presence. If you if you're unaware of the community of inquiry model, and um, if you want to learn a little bit more about the kind of the history of of UDL and how it's been used in college teaching, the McGuire article from 2011 is is extremely helpful. Inclusive college teaching, universal design for instruction, and diverse learners. So. That's another article I suggest that you uh, take a look at. Great. Thank you, guys. Um, hopefully, I will see you in other series. Um, feel free to email me or Rob if you think of any questions after the fact. And I hope everyone's having a good semester. I'm going to um, sign everyone off. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, thanks.